Uh, can you believe it's been two years since George Zimmerman shot and killed Trayvon Martin? Two years. That case has fueled a huge debate about stand your ground, self-defense, not to mention race. It's also got the attention of the president. Mr. Obama has been talking about it. In fact, he just announced a, a brand new initiative called My Brother's Keeper. And uh, we've had some extensive coverage on that. It is a program to help young men and boys of color succeed. Boys like Trayvon, who didn't get the chance to fulfill his dreams. In the aftermath of the Trayvon Martin verdict, with, with all the emotions and, and controversy that it sparked, I spoke about the need to bolster and reinforce our young men and give them the sense that their country cares about them and values them and is willing to invest in them. Trayvon Martin and Jordan Davis's parents were in the audience as the president spoke, and uh, this issue is without question a critical one. The president says this goes to the heart of why he ran for president. I want to bring back in Lisa Bloom, who's a legal analyst for Avo.com for, for the purposes of this conversation. She is best-selling author, and this is her latest work. It's called Suspicion Nation, the inside story of the Trayvon Martin injustice and why we continue to repeat it. Um, Lisa, I've been reading through the book, and it's, it's always remarkable when you get some time to digest. And two years since all of this began has been, I think, helpful. But at the same time, we still have cases being repeated that are somewhat similar. There is yes. profiling. Without relitigating the case, because you do an excellent job of going into why the prosecutors just botched this completely. But without relitigating it, I wanted to ask you something bigger. This has been your life. You've been in the law for a long time. You've been in and out of hundreds of courtrooms. So much has come down to profiling and that it's wrong. At the same time, we are brought up to say, keep your wits about you. If you see something, say something. And I don't know what Americans are supposed to think anymore. Are they supposed to just act as though nothing's going on around them? Mm -hmm. Are they supposed to feel bad if they sense there's something going wrong? Because for a lot of people, they don't quite know what to do with the results that they're seeing in courtrooms. So I, I think you're hitting on what really is the essence of my book, and I called it Suspicion Nation, because so many of us feel this awkwardness in talking about race or the suspicions about our neighbors, as George Zimmerman was so suspicious of Trayvon Martin, calling him a real suspicious guy, and that's how the whole incident began. And ultimately, I think we have to talk about race. For example, in the Zimmerman case, the defense said that Trayvon Martin was a match, that was their word, a match to two unrelated burglars who had been in that community. Community. Well, on what basis was he a match? It was on the basis of skin color. Well, and they were teenagers. Nobody in the no, but they were teenagers as well. Well, no, actually, they okay. were in their late 20s, uh, according to some reports, the, the mm -hmm. actual burglars. And Trayvon Martin, we know, was 17 years old. So it was skin color and, and gender, I would say, because they were both male. But Trayvon Martin had nothing to do with those well, burglars. Well, let me go back for a second, because I just am trying to recall so many details from that case. I think George Zimmerman thought that he was in his 20s when he said that to the 911 well, No, caller. he called him a kid. But he thought he was in his, in, in subsequent interviews, he said he could have been a teenager, could have been in his 20s. Yeah, but on that call, he said he was yeah. a kid, right? U ultimately, I think that the, the greater issue does come down to this. If people are being deluged with news about gang violence and shooting violence, doesn't that shape their information when they when they form fears. So, and they don't me, have to let, be let white people. That. I'm saying black people let can be as afraid question. of others and white people can be as afraid of others. I gave an example. I'd be scared if I saw four teenagers, I don't care what their color was, four kids, m young boys, coming down the street in a, in a street where I'm alone and they're rowdy and they're right. being act. I would cross the street. So let, let me answer that question because I think... Am I sexist? It, let, me, let me answer <laughs> the question, okay. Um, Many people in America are suspicious and afraid of our neighbors, and I think unfairly so. Crime actually is way down, down to 1960s levels. And at the heart of the Trayvon Martin case and the Jordan Davis case and many others is, let's be honest, a fear of African-American males. Not necessarily on your part or my part, but on the part of many people. When you add to that our lax gun laws and stand your ground laws, it's a terrible cocktail that leads to tragedies like this. So in my book, I go through the top six mistakes made by the prosecutors, but I also pull back and ask us all to look at ourselves. There's a wonderful test online that's available from Harvard University researchers called the Implicit Bias Test. And it turns out about 80% of white Americans test for implicit racial bias against African Americans. None of us wants to be called a racist. None of us wants to think we're a racist. I reveal in the book how I did on that test. Guess what? As a lifetime civil rights attorney, as a, children, as a mother of biracial children, I didn't do so well on that. And I think if we all can acknowledge that because of our culture, because of the media, we all 
all walk around with these unacknowledged biases, but the good news is, and this is at the end of the book, spoiler alert, the good mm -hmm. news is there's something we can do about it. Doctors, for example, who are educated to stop spending twice as much time with white patients as black patients, change their behavior. Police, judges, juries can change their behavior. It's a whole That's sale. The I mean, we're talking, a, you know, a wholesale overall no tangible results right away kind of change. But there were a lot of mistakes in, in that courtroom. And for everybody who thinks something went wrong in the Trayvon Martin case, this is what happened. So here you go. I'm going to hold it up once again. Uh, you're great. You're exhaustive in your research. You've done this with all your books. You always cite fact. And uh, there are plenty of footnotes in the back of the book as well for anybody who wants to relitigate the case as well <laughs> if they want to argue with her, not me. <laughs> Lisa, always good to have you. Thanks Thank for coming on. Thank you so on. much. Appreciate it.